Um, earlier this week, we mentioned about the role of lawyers in the lead up to the violence on January 6th, including the fateful um, January 3rd um, Oval Office showdown between Department of Justice lawyer Jeffrey Clark and other lawyers from the DOJ and the White House. Now, a big key player, and it is increasingly becoming clear, is former law professor John Eastman, whose efforts to persuade Vice Squatter Mike Pence to prevent the January 6th joint session of Congress from certifying um, President Joe Biden's rightful win of the Electoral College victory, and it was a central focus on, on Thursday's hearing. Um, someone was deliberately overstating the chances of the Supreme Court's intervention, and the, and was and, and in doing so, was to galvanize continue, continuing resistance um, that was peaceful or otherwise um, to the joint session. Now, on, one, on Wednesday morning, before Thursday's hearing, the New York um, Times publicly broke the details of an e- of an email that Eastman had sent out on December 24th, in which he encouraged Trump um, campaign officials to file papers in a Wisconsin appeal in an effort to get the Supreme Court to intervene. Now, the odds are not based on the legal merits, but it's an assessment of the justice's spine. And this is what Eastman had wrote, and I understand that there is a heated fight underway. <coughs> um, now, this email is not the first example of Eastman holding out the possibility of Supreme Court intervention and supporting efforts to block January 6th joint session. Now, indeed, on January 6th itself, Eastman's speech at the Klan rally preceding the violence at the Capitol alluded to ongoing litigation as another reason why Congress should, at the very least, delay the certification, a delay that Eastman privately acknowledged would have been unlawful. Now, here's just one fucking problem. Long before January 6th, and certainly by December 24th, it would, have, it would have been clear to anyone who published the Supreme Court, and Eastman included, that there was precisely zero chance that the justices would intervene. Now, by this logic, and, present, and representing that, about the heated fight underway, Eastman, Eastman knew he was either lying, or he was repeating information related to him that itself was a lie. Now, either way, someone was deliberately overstating the chances of Supreme Court intervention, and like I said, was do and by doing so is to galvanize continuing resistance, peaceful or otherwise, to the joint chief. Now it's hard to keep track of all this because in the litigation, seeking to overturn the results of the twenty twenty presidential election. But from the Supreme Court perspective, it's worth focusing on three different data points. Now the first came on December eighth. So on December third, Republican Pennsylvania Congressman Mike Kelly had asked the justices for emergency relief to block Pennsylvania from certifying Biden's rightful victory in that state after the Pennsylvania Supreme Court had refused to do so. Justice Samuel Alito, who was assigned to hear emergency applications coming out of Pennsylvania, <coughs> had originally ordered the state to respond by December 9th, but then he moved the deadline up a day, presumably so the full court could roll by December 8th. Now, um, the date, the, that date mattered because December 8th was the so-called safe harbor deadline under the Electoral College um, Count Act, and the date and the date by which if a state had du- had duly certified its election results, Congress Congress would be bound to follow that. Now, late in the afternoon on December 8th, the Supreme Court similarly, um, similarly denied Kelly's application with no public dissent. And, and so ruling, the court not only cleared the way for Pennsylvania to certify its results, but to do so by the safe harbor deadline. At the same... At the same time as the justices turned away Kelly's case, they were considering an even more amb- ambitious suit brought by Texas, and book in the Supreme Court's obscure original jurisdiction and its power to act first in disputes between two or more states. Texas sought permission to bring suit directly against Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Georgia, alleging that officials in each state violated their own state's election laws and thereby, and their, and thereby violating the Constitution now in ways that affected the ultimate result of an election. But on December 11th, on Friday, December 11th, the court refused to allow Texas to proceed. Justices Clarence Thomas and Alito noted that they thought the court had to hear Texas's case because Congress has given the Supreme Court exclusive jurisdiction over such disputes. And it, and it went out of their way to say nothing about the merits of Texas' extraordinary claims. Now, Eastman's um, representation on December 24th that there's going to be a heated fight underway that the court was still debating whether to get involved is simply implausible. The court's refusal to intervene on December 11th was the second critical moment for the Electoral College um, 
and it would formally meet in each state capital the following Monday, December 14th. Now, thus, everyone knew that by turning Texas's case away on Friday, the Supreme Court was clearing the way for the Electoral College to vote and to vote for the for the and, for, and to vote for the rightful president elect Biden. Now, even if the justices had wanted to intervene in a way that would allow them to consider the challenges from President from the former squatter Donald Trump and his sycophants, um, December 11th was the la was the last plausible date at which they could have done so. The whole point of the Supreme Court's ruling and Bush vs. Gore in 2000 was to intervene before the safe harbor deadline. Now, finally, even as the court refused to intervene in Kelly's case or in Texas, the justices continued to simply su sit on a number of petitions for review and other suits alleging um, and challenging their ele election results. Now, in at least eight of those cases, the parties had asked the court not only to review lower court rulings, but to expedite consideration um, so that such a ruling could come in a time to make a difference. And yet, the justices let those motions sit on their docket by neither by neither granting or denying them while events in the real world had the effect of mooting them. The court would formally deny the motions to expedite on January 11th, and this was the third critical data point. Now, thus, even if the court's non-intervention in the Kelly and Texas cases had come only after the heated behind-the-scenes battles, Eastman's representation on December 24th said that there was a heated fight underway and that this court was still debating whether to get involved. Is Like I said, it's simply implausible. The court had already passed up numerous opportunities to intervene at a time when such intervention could have made a difference. Now, by December 24th, it is clear that the court intended to do whatever it could to sit out the post-election drama, even if some number of justices might have preferred otherwise. Now, none of this proves that Eastman is lying, of course, but but even though we knew he was. Now, it's entirely, pos it's entirely possible that someone he trusts and who had, and, and who, <coughs> and he had reason to believe um, he and who he had reason to believe could speak to the court's internal machinations to, and that told him that the justices were um, still debating whether to get involved. And now Eastman clerked for Thomas. Um, he clerked for the, for the Supreme Court Thomas and we know that he was in regular contact with Ginny um, Thomas about post-election illegal challenges. So there's at, least a, there's at least a possibility that Eastman was, was relaying what he had been told versus making this up himself. Now, <clears throat> now, Eastman's first post to his new substack on Thursday carefully denied, denied some, but not all the allegations in the reporting about his conversations with Ginny Thomas. Now, the key for, for the present purposes, though, is that someone was almost certainly lying about what the Supreme Court was and, and wasn't up to. Um, and also, an all, an all and also, and all to mislead Trump sycophants into believing that there was a meaningful possibility that further litigation would 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 produce the result that they wanted, even though they knew that it wasn't going to happen. Now the January sixth committee has plenty of work to do, but with every new development getting to the bottom of this particular issue and determining who was behind the ongoing misrepresentation of the possibility of the Supreme Court intervention, it seems like an increasingly significant part of the story. Now, yeah, so the so the Trump sycophants should feel betrayed because they were lied to by by not just Trump but by everybody around him. So they should feel betrayed because they knew damn well that Trump was not going to win a second term. And not just that, no matter how much he pressured people, they knew that this was not going to be overturned. And um, and they still believed that the election could be overturned somehow. Just like that crackhead Mike Lindell keeps insisting that he has evidence to prove that the election was stolen, which it, which it wasn't. So, um, yeah, so these sycophants should feel betrayed because they knew damn well that whatever Trump tried to do, it was not going to be overturned. So if you like the video, give the video a like and subscribe to my channel, RBW King. You can also hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified when a new video comes out. And if you want to support my work even further, you can donate to my Patreon link, which you can find in the belt section of YouTube. And for just a little, it's a few bucks a month. Um, your, channel, um, your donation can help the channel go a long way, and thanks for listening.